since it's usually just a coworker night too, we always get weirded out with like the whole like trying to introduce the podcast thing. But uh, I'll follow your lead. Yeah, yeah. So this is this is a uh, the book club without a club, and it looks a little different. Joy, joy is not not present, but instead we have a special guest, Wallace Barker, and he wrote. Here it comes. La, la, sir. Oh, of course, as soon as I start saying it, that's all right. Let me cut that up. We can cut that up. La Serenissima. La Seren, Serenissima. La Ser. I'm going I'm to put a, I'm going to put a, uh, I'm going to put a, uh, an image with it too for the, the video. So, so people can see it and pronounce it what feels best for them because the title comes from, it's Italian. Yes. Yeah, so the, it's an Italian word. I, I think it just essentially means kind of like the most serene. Um, and it's a, sort of a classical name for Venice, Italy. Like, I guess, you know, it was used more in antiquity or something like that. Uh, um, but um, uh, a lot of the book, you know, it takes place in Venice. And that just kind of, we settled on that for for the title. But um, Okay, so that wasn't the original title as you compiled the the poems. It came up came up later? Well, that's a great question because, you know, the process was interesting. So I, the poems in the book represent like 10 years of writing poetry in different places. And so what I, what I would do is I would go to a place and I'd, I'd write poetry when I was there. And then, um, and then I would kind of create a title for that collection of poems, almost like a chapbook kind of. Okay. And, and so the one I did about Venice, I called La Serenissima and um which i'm mispronouncing for sure but um sounded better than when i tried to say it for sure <laughs> i've actually never bothered it's sad to say i've never bothered to like try to listen to how you know somebody pronounced it correctly but um uh so anyway when we put it together what the book is is it's kind of a collection of what it's almost like a collection of a bunch of little chapbooks really and um we just kind of that that was the title of the venice chapbook and it just felt felt like it fit nicely for the collection as a whole. So that, you know, it was kind of, um, yeah, that was the process. I know that, uh, that chapbook vibe definitely comes through. I mean, each, each part has its own feeling and almost, I don't want to say style, but like it, it, they're separate. You can tell like it was a different point in time. And I, and as you mentioned, like the 10 years, I, I saw how almost like some of the writing changed throughout so was it chronologically with the vacations or did you mix and match once you just started started compiling we we actually mixed and matched so that's that's a, a great thing that that you notice because if if it had been chronological I think you would see pretty starkly like you know changes in how I was writing because the very earliest ones um really the very earliest collection is the one that deals with West Texas I think it's called Way Out West and it's kind of like Marfa and Big Bend and all that stuff that was in a way that was kind of like when I first started writing poetry sort of like post being in school you know I obviously I wrote poems as needed in school and I you know I shouldn't even undersell it like I've always kind of been a poet but um but that's when I on on the trip we, we went on to that area we stayed at a little motel outside Marfa and with inside the room we stayed in was like a typewriter, like a old fashioned Remington oh, typewriter, you know, that's fantastic. And it was great. I, I mean, I wish more hotel rooms had stuff like that because I just started playing with it and started and, you know, started writing little poems on it and um, ended up like taking it out to the pool and sitting by the pool and doing it while, you know, my wife swam around and stuff. It wasn't and like a tag. It, like, it, was like, it. it was just a yeah. typewriter in the room. Yeah, yeah, it was just sitting in the room I think it was decor almost more than it was like intended to be functional you know but it worked the little scratch paper they usually give you and fit it into the typewriter yeah yeah just a little memo pad on the you know on the desk or whatever I tore off a page and put it in there and that is um, fantastic I just had so much fun with it I, it was just like I, something you know so tactile and like those old typewriters like each keystroke's like almost like a gunshot or something it's like bang 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 you know it's it's really uh invigorating almost you know it's so different than the little key computer keyboard oh, yeah. way of writing anyway um so that kind of got me I had so much fun with it I kind of like <laughs> rediscovered poetry but to the so if that's the earliest one if they were arranged chronologically I think you'd see a lot of change because as I continue to write more and more and more poems you know obviously the way I was writing them evolved a lot and 
I, when I started writing more poems, I got into reading more contemporary poetry. I kind of like almost stopped reading poetry after college and stuff. So I, you know, I had read a lot of the classics and all that, but I had had, had kind of lost any kind of connection with sort of what people are doing right now, you know, but, but writing more poetry myself made me more interested in contemporary poets. And so they, you know, reading contemporary poets influenced my, um, my style a lot. So um, anyway, it's not chronological. I, Bram and I kind of agreed on the way it's laid out um, because I think it's more of a narrative arc maybe than, than if we had done okay. it chronologically. Okay. It just works better in some ways, but, um, but yeah. When you submitted the collection for publication, did you have an intention to put it in more of an order or did, how did, I guess, how did, how did going about getting published? How did that, how did the, yeah. how did the initial thing start? How did the whole book take off? Yeah, yeah. So what happened was, I, I don't even think I was following on Twitter, Godpile Press. They're, they're fairly new, so I just hadn't heard of them yet. But, you know, through retweets or something, I saw a call for submissions from Godpile, poetry submissions, for poems that were about place. And I, because I had written all these poems about these different places, I was like, oh, perfect. So I, I sent, and it was for a magazine. It wasn't for, they were going to do like a magazine, a Godpile magazine. And so the first issue's theme was going to be place. So I sent in uh, a few poems and um, and they were accepted. Bram wrote me back. Bram Riddlebarger is the publisher of Godpile Press, the publisher, or he's the editor and the, of my publisher, Godpile Press. And uh, he, Bram accepted the poems. And then um, a few months later, I think he emailed me and he said something to do. He kind of was like, you know, I don't think we're going to do the magazine after all. We want, we want to focus on publishing books and the magazine just kind of feels like, you know, a distraction a little bit from what we're really trying to do. But he was like, but do you have any other poems that are like this, that are about place? And I was like, yeah, I got a ton. I've been writing them for the last like literally 10 years, you know? And uh, I sent him a bunch and he was just, he was like, yeah, I like these. Let's just do a book of these instead of, you know, um, instead of the magazine. So um, so yeah, so I mean, what's in the book is is a subset. I mean, I have a lot of these poems, and and so Bram helped me, um, you know, narrow it down, which I really needed because I, you know, I almost I needed somebody to sort through all this stuff with me because I just had lost perspective, and it's hard, you know, especially when you're writing about like experiences you've had and family and stuff, which is a major theme in the book. The nostalgia and like sentimentality comes into play, and so you might not be the best judge of your own writing or at least how what's going to be most interesting for a reader because some things just have kind of like you know they tug at your own heartstrings because you remember the context but it could be less meaningful for a reader so right Bram was great to sort through all that stuff and then um he helped you know we worked together to order it a certain way but I I, I in the acknowledgments I kind of say something to the effect of you know I want I've had to thank Bram for for the for because the collection wouldn't exist without him and it's so true because he was he drove the whole thing in terms of like I didn't even view this work as a poetry collection necessarily and Bram just kind of pulled it together made it cohesive just put a lot of his own time and energy into um you know finding the right poems and, and ordering them in the right way and so um I I I, tr I mean I consider Bram honestly like a co you know co-writer in some ways or or is that his the editorial work he did is kind of above and beyond in my opinion so right. that's a that's a it's a fantastic way to create a book like that's that's awesome like I I don't even know what to it's say great. and I, I I would I mean you know if anybody gets a chance to work with Bram if you're sitting on a poetry collection or I think at the moment they've just been publishing poetry but maybe he'll do some fiction or something I don't know but anyway if you have any opportunities to share your work with Bram and and you know, maybe work with God, pal. He's, it's, he's such a good guy. He's just a great, great guy. Oh yeah. So as I, as I was, uh, reading through it, this thought crossed my mind and it was, did you really go to all these places? I did, but you know, again, over the course of like 10 years, it, it, if you just read it, you'd be like, wow, this guy's always, always traveling. But, um, you're talking about maybe a couple trips a year over like 10 years, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So each, each little, each little, the way I read it and I might be right, I might be wrong, but, uh, so each little chat book is like one vacation. So even when it was like a couple different 
spots, like a couple different spots in Mexico that was still the same vacation? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sometimes we, we, Mexico is my go-to. I, I live in Austin, Texas. And so a flight to Mexico to the Yucatan area where Cancun is. So basically Austin to Cancun, those flights are super short. That's like a two hour flight. Oh. And so, you know, you can, you can leave like winter snow in Austin and be on the beach 80 <laughs> degrees in, in Mexico. And like, you know, you leave in the morning, you're on the beach in the afternoon. It's, it's, I feel like it's like, um, it's like our backyard almost, you know? So, um, so we go to Mexico all the time, especially that Yucatan area as much as we can. Huh? So yeah, so when we go, we'll often like either rent a car or, you, you know, one of the other nice things about Mexico is that you can get like a driver and all that good stuff for, you know, pretty affordable. Um, so, so we would, yeah, just, just drive around. We frequently drive around to different spots in that Yucatan area. So, so yeah, each, each chat book, you're, to circle back to your question. Yeah. Each chat book represents one trip. Okay. That's so now that I know it also took, I mean, I think I assumed it took a while because you know, that's, that was some globe trotting if, uh, if it was one <laughs> trip. So it, it's, it's interesting to go back um, and read it. Cause you mentioned your, your children a lot. And yeah. so now that you see, you can in a way as they I mean, you never say their ages are like what's going on, but it's interesting to think about as these poems are going on, your your children are growing as well. So it's just this. So you're growing as a poet. You're watching your family grow. You're having these great experiences. It's just the whole thing is it's really fascinating. It's really, it's really fantastic. <laughs> yeah, no, thanks for saying that. I, I um, yeah, I agree. Like there's stuff. Yeah. If you look at, you know, I mean, some of the earlier works our chat books within the collection. Yeah. My kids are babies, you know, and then the, the more recent ones, you know, my daughter is now 14, my son is 12. So, I mean, they're practically teenagers. So I think, yeah, probably, I mean, my guess would be uh, they probably become more prominent in the collection in the later chat books, just because, you know, when, what is there to say about babies? I mean, you know, I don't know. It's just, I don't want that. That sounds like no, no. I love babies. Don't get me wrong. No, I <laughs> currently, I currently have a six month old at home. That's why I got this going on because we want to see if he does that thing where like he freaks out when I cut my hair. So we're yeah, just kind of, kind of letting it go wild to see what happens. I think, I think, uh, I think we're doing it tomorrow. It so timing on my part for the this soft camera. But yeah, you definitely <laughs> the children. The children do. There's definitely vacations where they're definitely more prominent. So I guess as they, you know, as they they grow and they're able to interact or make the comments like how um one of the they would allow you into their magazine like this no oh, right little, right yeah little yeah, yeah, things yeah. like that it's it's really yeah. it's really interesting to, to pick in uh, or find as you read through it these these little tidbits of your of your life basically so yeah I mean I think you know I don't know I, I think You'll find, I mean, that all parents find that, you know, it's really amazing when kids sort of develop their personality, watching their personalities unfold is like one of the most crazy, rewarding, in my opinion, things about being a parent, you know, and for me, I mean, just kind of like dad to dad, when you have a, a little baby, they, especially if your wife is nursing, they, they need their, their uh, mom a lot, and they right. want their mom a lot. The dad, you know, should, can and should help out and relieve mom as much as possible and all that good stuff. But as they age and they kind of develop personalities and get into their own activities and things, I think the role of the dad can become more, um, you know, uh, you, you can become a bigger part of their life, I guess. And I, I don't, I don't want to, it's hard to say, cause I, I don't want to suggest that dads aren't, you know, present involved in the raising of babies. Of course you, they can, and should be, but. No, it, it, that yeah. makes sense. That makes sense. Like it's, it's a totally different, well, this is my first rodeo, so I can't, you know, hundred <laughs> percent, but, but even, even within the first six months, I've already seen a, a personality starting to, to develop and uh, certain times, there's certain things that I'll do that my wife does differently. So he'll want to play the little game where I put the diaper on his face. It's a whole thing, but, <laughs> but yeah, no, but it makes sense. So as, as they, they, as he grows, it's going to be, I can already tell it's going to be a wild ride yeah and you know maybe he'll do kind of he'll 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 i'm sure uh, find activities that he likes what whatever that might be art science sports whatever and so you'll kind of get involved as a dad in that you know maybe you'll coach a team or 
lead a field trip for the, you know, whatever group he's in or something. They'd want so, me for the field trip. They would not want me to coach a single thing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm kind of similar, I, I would say. But, um, but my, yeah, my point is that just as they get older and they develop their own interests and stuff, as a dad, there's more and more ways for you to become, you know, active in their lives and participant more. Yeah. So anyway, but circling back to the book and to what, you know, the point you were making. Yeah. I think as the, as the chronologically, as the chat books progress, there's more interaction kind of on a personal level with the kids beyond just sort of, you know, with a baby, you kind of, you can admire the baby and, and that, you know, certainly that can inspire poetry but you don't kind of get the conversational feedback and stuff that can, that can uh, take it in a different direction. Right. And uh, I guess, so when, so I guess uh, 10 years. So when was the, when was the Hawaii trip, the last chat book? And I, I'll explain why I'm asking this one in a second, but when, when was that one in the whole, in the whole scheme of the 10 years? Was it like near the that end or was it in the middle? No, that actually is the most recent. That was in last August, actually. Just last August. The reason I was curious about that one is because just that last, that last stanza as the book that closes the whole book couldn't have been more perfect. Like that was the most wonderful little set of lines to end this whole, whole journey. So, I, so. Oh man, I appreciate you saying that. Oh yeah. yeah that, yeah, I, I you know, when I when I wrote that I, I can't say I was like writing the last lines of a, the collection but I was writing the last lines of that trip you know mm -hmm. so um and and also that's partly uh uh Bram is responsible you know Bram did a lot like I said in terms of organizing the book and I think there was probably other poems that could he could have used for the ending but he you know he chose that one so again I just you know Bram had a vision mm -hmm. that that uh that I love and that was really great of him to uh to kind of take on the project you know all right well y'all can I can definitely tell both both y'all yeah, put some put some work and love into this one so yeah I, I'd say so like I said I mean it represents my life kind of my adult life you know um since you know the very earliest stuff like I said is the West Texas stuff and that was when I was newly married in my early 20s or, or actually mid-20s and um my wife was pregnant with our daughter. And so like, you know, it's kind of like my whole adult life, you know, post-college is sort of, for me, you know, reflected in the book. Um, I mean, that's why I, I was writing the poems in part was because I just wanted to document like how I felt at that time and how, you know, I wanted to, I wanted to remember not just photos from, from these trips, but like what was going on with me, you know, how I was thinking about the world and myself and my place in it. Um, so yeah, so the book, I mean, yeah, a lot of work's gone in the book in terms of like, yeah, it's kind of like my whole adult life. And then also, you know, Bram put a ton of, of work and effort into it too. So oh, that's, no, that's actually, uh, that's very beautiful. The fact that capturing yourself and not just a photograph, but those, those very specific subjective moments is, it's really wonderful. Uh, did you yeah, want to, that comes through in the book? Oh yeah, no, definitely. Definitely. Did you, uh, did you want to read a few or you got, I don't know how long your lunch is or yeah yeah i can do that um shoot i'm i didn't um i don't have a printout handy of it gosh I'm, i feel foolish um let me um pull one up yeah definitely and why i guess while you're looking for that you got any more uh vacations planned or scheduled or is, Where are has, you going? is this whole last couple of years really thrown a wrench into the cogs there well, definitely this last couple of years has made it more difficult. Um, we, um, we're going back to um, uh, the Yucatan, Mexico okay. in Mar uh, this month over spring break. When my kids are out for spring break, we're going back. This time we're going to um, Puerto Morelos, which is an area we haven't visited so far. It's, okay. um, it's not far from Cancun. I, I think it's maybe an hour or so drive outside of Cancun, but it's it's much less developed. It's kind of a a fish an old fishing town that is um, just now starting to see more tourists and things like right. that. So the right. idea is, you know, we want to check it out before it gets kind of overrun. A lot of the great places in that area, like Tulum and um, Playa del Carmen, and and all the little nice little beach towns, are now pretty 
well discovered you know yeah so you have to kind of venture further afield to get to the interesting stuff so so we're doing that Puerto Morales and then we're going to go to back to Holbosch we visited a lot Holbosch is a really cool spot if you ever get a chance in that area it's an island off the coast it's I think you have to drive for like two hours out of Cancun and take a ferry out to the island Holbosch is spelled H-O-L-B-O-X because it's Mayan, the name is Mayan. So another one super cool thing about the Yucatan is that, um, you know, you've got the Mexican culture because it's obviously part of Mexico, but there's a strong Mayan culture, which is uh, distinct from Mexican culture. It's unique. Uh, you, food, language, the, the Mayan uh, people there speak a distinct, you know, language, Mayan. And so a lot of the place names and things have the, that Mayan um, influence. And so, um, yeah, so it's like the X pronounced as like a CH. I'm, I'm sure there's linguists who would, who would disagree with how I'm characterizing it, but that's what it sounds like to me um, is like, you see that in a lot of place names and things and it's the Mayan influence. And then um, I'll tell you a funny, a funny thing that somebody told me once when I was in that area, the Yucatan is like super flat. Um, and, but there's like kind of hills. So, so what, a, what a local told me one time was that anytime you see a mound or a hill in the Yucatan, that is a Mayan ruin that just hasn't been uh, excavated yet, you know, because they, they, over time they've gotten covered in dirt and right. plants. And because the Yucatan has no real hills. So if you see a hill, it's most likely a, a Mayan ruin. And, and they're everywhere, you know. We think of Mayan ruins as like, and I, I'm digressing, I know, but hopefully this is, it, it's interesting to me. Yeah. We think of Mayan ruins as like the big palatial things like Chichen Itza or something like that. Right. But, but if you're in that Yucatan area, a lot of just like private landowners, ranchers and things have Mayan ruins on their land. And it's, it may not be a, you know, a temple complex like Chichen Itza, but they'll have kind of like, you know, some sort of like smaller temple or altars or things like that with carvings. It's amazing to me you know, how much archaeological history there is just like, you know, people are using like Mayan ruins for like an outdoor barbecue grill, you know, it's, it's like amazing. It's, That's, it's wild. That's, yeah. absolutely wild. That's fantastic. Yeah. Um, maybe, maybe I'll read a poem. So I, I was able to pull up the collection. Maybe I'll read a poem that, that relates to uh, the Yucatan and Mayan, awesome. if I can find one specifically around Mayan, um, you know, Mayan culture that integrates my cultural elements that's one but again it's just like one of the reasons why i love that area so much is because that whole you know that whole mayan um influence right uh, here we go so this is from the the chat book um called yucateca and the poem is called sian khan which is a um a nature preserve in that area that's okay. that's really beautiful if, if you ever have a chance to visit i recommend it it's very unspoiled um okay so this is sian khan Cut the cord, cut all ties, certain apps or social media, cut right through a channel carved by Mayans at the mouth, a stone aduana, edificio crocodile totems carved into rock mantle, and a door so low one is forced to bow, forced to sacrifice a handheld device to the great god of whatever mangroves grow in these bays. Um, and one thing interesting about that, that idea of a door so low, we, we were exploring some some kind of off the beaten path Mayan ruins with a guide in Mexico and the temple that you could enter did have a super small like low door I mean probably four feet you know tall or something like that and we asked the guide you know why the door so low well we kind of were like was that because Mayans tend to be short and so we were sort of like oh is that how short the you know Mayan people were and he said no the idea is they would put these really low doors on their temple so you were literally forced to bow on your way into the temple, you know, out of respect for the for the gods. That's a Which genius move. Cool. That's a genius <laughs> move right there. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So that's you know, I as much as the poems are about kind of how I'm feeling, like I said, or my family, I also tried really hard to incorporate you know cultural elements from all the different places, and yeah, just give them like a real strong kind of sense of place. You know right. what I mean? Um, to the extent I could, you know, I mean, I'm not a scholar of any of these places, so I don't want to give people the wrong idea that I'm like, you know, no, but it's still, sort of it's still your, your experiences there. And that's, I think that's what's, you don't have to be the scholar at that point because it's, it's you, you know, it's talking about yourself. So that works. It totally yeah. works. 
yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd say that's right. Um, maybe I'll read one more that also relates to that. You oh, definitely. Area. Definitely. This is from a separate chapbook within the collection, but again, back at the Yucatan. This one's called, the, this chapbook is called Estructura, um, which just means, I think, structure. And it, and it takes place in Bacalar. Bacalar is a really, really, really cool um, small town. They call them pueblos, small pueblo in the Yucatan um, that has this like crystal clear lake, like freshwater lake, but it looks like it looks like ocean water in the sense that it's like turquoise and beautiful and it's surrounded by like white sand beaches. It's really unique. I've, I've seen a lot of lakes, you know, especially in the United States. And um, I've never seen anything like Bacalot. It's, it's like an icy blue lake oh, wow. that just, it's really something. And the, the Pueblo itself is super cool. It's, there's almost no tourists there. The only places that stay are, are kind of like eco lodges that, you know, are very kind of primitive. Um, but yeah, I, I would just, yeah, if, if anybody gets a chance to visit Bacalot, uh, couldn't recommend it enough. So um, this one is called Lagoon and Ocean View. Saw points for miles and also disagreements, angry feelings, blue water, blue skies, heavy brow and dark eyes, thoughts burning off in the sun, clouds followed and I ruined other things. She withdrew for the safety of sunnier people, sunnier climes, the Yucatan, breathing us, inhaling us, deep inward, bosk lungs, black and leafy and wet. Now, it's so great to hear you actually hear you hear you read them because uh, there's not a lot of punctuation going on. So it's. Yeah. it's I love hearing your rhythm to it like it's it's there like you can you can hear it like you can hear oh, man, extra meaning that, yeah. reading so but yeah, yeah the punctuation the lack of punctuation I would say is kind of somewhat driven by the circumstances I wrote them in like all these poems were written in by hand in journals because I was you know traveling I didn't have right. a computer or I wasn't you know I was the whole the whole method is just like like dashing off a poem and like you know, the 10, 10 minutes you get in between, you know, one activity and the next or whatever. So I, I, I would just bring journals and a pen and write them down. So then I, then I have to, when I get back to the States, I type them into a, a computer so that, you know, on Google Docs or whatever. So I've got, I've got them in a way that's like more usable, but yeah, when I write them, I didn't really use much punctuation or anything because I was, um, uh, you know, just jotting them down as quick as I could, you know, yeah. they're very immediate in that regard, you know, right. I, I, uh, I do put like a fair bit of work into them on the back end. Like I get the, I, I come home from my trips with the raw material and I do spend some time um, just kind of tweaking it, editing it, working through it. And also just, I, you know, I just card a lot. I'm a poet that like, I probably keep half or even less than half of the poems I write. I just throw a lot of them away. Cause I just, you know, I'm trying, I just, I feel like that's my uh, method is just to kind of write a lot and then, later make decisions about what's worth keeping and what's not right so uh, yeah so i'd say like the, the style of the poems is driven a lot by the circumstances under which they were written you know yeah no definitely definitely so for uh we're uh we're looking in to get a copy for here but for those if anyone is not in and around the jefferson public library where can they where can they pick up a copy yeah, I mean, the best place is Gob Pile Press. That's G-O-B Pile, P-I-L-E Press. I think if anyone, you know, just searches it online, you'll find the website and then you can buy it directly from the publisher. That'd be the best approach. I think it, uh, it, it is or very soon will be also available on Amazon. So if people prefer to use Amazon, I, you know, I don't love Amazon personally, but, uh, it, you know, we do use, I do use it from time to time because yeah. it's convenient and all that. So, you know, that's also an option if you I think it's on Amazon or will be very soon. And, uh, but if you, if you go to Godpile Press, that'd be the best place to, to buy it. That's awesome. Well, I really appreciate you taking out the, the time here for the first ever book club without a club. Oh, no. My Talking pleasure. about like a book it's with cool. author. That's, that's a wild thought. That's, <laughs> well, man, I'm so grateful that you invited me. And, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, this has been, this has been super cool. Well, I probably should give the, uh, the manager back her office. I don't know what she's been doing for the last hour or so. <laughs> standing outside the door, kind of tapping her toe or something. Probably is. She... <laughs> but yeah, but it was, it's been great talking to you. It's been great hearing how, how the whole book was put together and all the, the ins and outs of everything. But, and again, thank oh, you. Man, yeah. Thank you so yeah. much for doing this. Thank you for having me.
probably have another meeting after this one about commandeering her office. But. <laughs> yeah.